Okay, so uh, now that you have heard all about the challenges of occurrence data, let me further bother you with all the challenges of environmental data. <laughs> so um, in our big modeling kind of schematic here, we just talked about occurrence data up here, and to orient you, we are here. And we're gonna be talking about the environmental data that you're gonna be throwing into your algorithm to get your output, okay? We're gonna talk about the role of environmental data, the characteristics, and the sources. So the interesting thing about environmental data is that when you have an occurrence of a bird or some species, we don't, like, it's there, but they're using that environment in lots of different ways. And I study birds, so I kind of think about birds. So I think about, okay, there's a spot in the environment where this bird is nesting, there's a spot where maybe he's foraging on the ground, maybe he's singing over here trying to attract a mate in one of these perches. And when I go to make a model, I have to kind of find the variables that are going to be addressing the way that the species is gonna interact with this environment, right? And so that's kind of, it's kind of hard. So going back to this BAM diagram, which you're probably gonna see for the rest of the time that you're here, we're trying to find some of the, bi the favorable biotic uh, environmental conditions and abiotic environmental conditions so we can kind of get here into that little sweet spot. But it's not just that straightforward, oh, temperature or precipitation. There's lots of different things and how those variables are gonna influence your species are also different. So we can classify them in lots of ways. We can say, hey, there are variables that directly influence the species. There are variables that indirectly influence the species, but then it, that also depends on the scale. So it's not just straightforward, right? Or we can say, hey, maybe they kind of respond to it, but they're correlated with another variable. It's really this other variable that I'm interested. So I'm gonna use this other variable as a proxy, right? So it's, it's never, I'm not saying never, it's really, it's really difficult to, to find those variables and it takes a lot of thought. And I think that is the one thing I really hope to impress on you guys is like the thought when you're choosing your variables because there's so many um, spatial issues and direct influences on your species. So for those of you who had said, I have no arc map experience, I'm going to tell you kind of what a raster is because all of our environmental variable is gonna be in a raster format. So raster format is basically by this gridded surface where each uh, cell, pixel, or grid, or however you wanna call it, has a uh, data variable in it. So let's say that we're talking about elevation. We have some you know, s unit of the earth. We've measured a, some measurement, temperature, elevation, and we've put it in each of those grids. And that's gonna be how our environmental variables are gonna be put into our model, okay? So in these rasters, we kind of have four characteristics that we really need to be thinking about when we're choosing them. We have a georeferencing system, the type of the raster, the quality, the spatial and temporal resolution. That was five, I said four. There's five. <laughs> so the georeferencing system is really important because ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to take this globe that's a circle and we're trying to flatten it out and make a flat surface so we can put it into our model, right? And you can't do that unless you first take your circular surface and kind of cut it up into portions so that you can then project it into a flat surface, right? So in order to do that, we have to have a geographic coordinate system. So we have to have some sort of like origin upon which we are gonna then put numbers. So here we have like the prime meridian and the equator when we're using like lat long, those are our, our origins, right? But then once we have that geographic system, we then have to project it, right? So we have to take it from the circle and like flatten it out and make it a nice flat raster. So the way that we do that is we apply a map projection. And the way that map projections work is that if you imagine a light source kind of inside the Earth shining out, and you had a surface, a flat surface, either a plane, a, con a cone, or a cylinder, how the, if the light was shining through and it would be projected onto that surface, that becomes our map projection. So as you can imagine, where the Earth is tangent to those shapes, you have like the highest quality, right? It's like exactly the same shape, size, and all of that, right? But as your light has to move away, so let's say the light's in here and you're moving away from the cone, it gets distorted. You think of like the puppet figures you used to make with your hands, you know, like you're really close to the light, you could be like bunnies and butterflies, but as you move away, it gets all like fuzzy, like what is that? I don't know, it's a amoeba, you know? So, <laughs> so when we start thinking about map projections, and your study area and your extent, it's really important that you understand what kind of coordinate system you're using and what kind of map projection because you can't keep all of the aspects of the geographic environment the same as they are on Earth or, or perfect, right? So you can either say, hey, I really am interested in the shape, I'm interested in the area, or I'm interested in distances, but we can't preserve all three of those when we start distorting a round thing into a flat thing, okay? 
So for me, I would say, hey, maybe area is really important to me. So when I'm looking at my, at my data, I need to make sure that I'm thinking about equal area projections because it's preserving the area and not so much the shape. You all have seen those different projections in the United States where one's really pretty and one's like all wonky, right? So we have different ways of looking at these different uh, characteristics and we want to make sure that we're using projections that are preserving the thing that we're interested in. Cool? Okay. So why do we care? I think I've seen this forever, this particular graphic, but I've never seen anything that does such a good job of, of describing this exactly. So here in the green, we only have a lat long, and then we have a, a, a conic, right? A conic projection and a mercator, which I think is cylindrical. I'm not 100% sure on that. But as you can see, if you were to try to take a point on these three different let's say, rasters, if they were rasters, you would get different, they wouldn't line up exactly, right? Because nothing here is lined up appropriately, yeah? So this is why it's really important that you think about your environmental data all being in the same exact coordinate system with the same map projection, yeah? And it's gonna be really tricky because if you're an ArcMap user, you guys know this, it projects on the fly. You can just throw data in there and it's gonna look like it lines up, but then you try to run some analyses and it's like, oh, I can't do that. Well, why can't you ArcMap? Check your projection, that's probably why, okay? And, or you're gonna, it will run it and then you'll be like something crazy that you get back. You're like, what is that? Okay, so then we have kind of two types of environmental data that, or, that you're gonna come across. You're gonna have these like, categorical discrete fields to think of like land cover, right? The thing about your discrete fields is that it's all the variation is dependent upon the number of classifications that this map has been divided into, right? You can have like NLCD, which has like a ton of land cover classes, or you can get like the simplified ones that maybe have forest, water, and urban, right? Maybe that's less meaningful than something that has a lot more discrete fields, right? So when you're thinking about discrete data, really think about how much of that variation you're gonna be getting in those fields because the less variation you have is a little bit harder to pull out what's interesting about where your species is versus the background, right? And then we also have continuous surfaces, which is kind of what I showed you earlier, where each pixel is gonna have a, a number, and you know, pixel one next to pixel two can be completely different, but it's gonna be an actual like measurement of some kind. There's gonna be a number associated with temperature, precipitation, um, NDBI, something like that. And then, so we've talked about types, and then these types of rasters can kind of come from two different places. You have remotely sensed data, which is coming from satellites, planes, things like that, where e every single pixel is actually measured, right? So maybe our satellite is picking up the reflectance of the Earth and we're converting that to land surface temperature or NDVI or something like that, but every single pixel is measured versus an interpolated surface, which just tends to mostly be like your, your weather data where they have stations and then they interpolate between those stations to give you a raster so not every single pixel is actually measured, right? You'll find that, um, yeah, climate, kind of climate, but yeah, there's all kinds. I'm not gonna try to categorize it. That's only climate and that's not because it doesn't quite work that way. Okay, my favorite part, uh, spatial resolution. So I'm really interested in scaling and spatial resolution. So when you're finding environmental data, we talked about like the spatial scale of your occurrence data, right? Is it at the county level as Xiao pointed out, or is it something that has, that's very precise? Does someone go with a GPS and find it exactly, oh, right here in this bush, right? So when you have really coarse occurrence data and you used coarse um, environmental variable, it kind of matches, you can probably get away with that. If you have really uh, fine scale data and you use very fine scale resolution, again, that also works really nicely. And I forgot to tell you what resolution is because there's probably, maybe some of you don't know. Um, the resolution is the actual amount of the Earth that's being covered by those little pixels, right? So you can have really coarse resolution where maybe one of those pixels represents 10 kilometers on the Earth, or really fine resolution where it represents like 10 centimeters or one meter or 30 meters like Landsat or something like that. So there's a whole variation of spatial resolution that you can choose and you want it to match as close as you can to your occurrence data, right? You wanna make sure that you're capturing variation in your study area, because if it's too coarse, you're gonna lose a lot of that variation. If it's too fine, you're gonna have a lot of noise, right? If you study something like coyotes or lions or something, if you use one meter resolution data, is it really meaningful? I don't know, maybe not, right? Maybe something more, you can get away with something more coarse and you'll be able to better uh, discriminate between uh, presences and non, or background. And then uh, scale, so yeah. 
When we say scale, I try not to use the word scale because scale actually has several meanings. There's grain and there's extent, and then there's also map scale. So I try really hard to separate the idea of grain or being the actual size of your cells and extent being the actual area that, that you're gonna be looking at versus a map scale, which you think that's a large scale map. It means that you're really focused in because everything's large, right? So it's, it's kind of opposite of what, of what you think. But I try, try not to use the word scale. Like this is a large scale mapping thing. Well, what does that mean? Was your extent large? Was your, was your grain large? Try to stick with grain and extent, just so you don't confuse your, your readers. Also, um, temporal resolution, which I know Town kind of touched on earlier, is that your, the way that, especially in remote sensing data, um, it's collected at different frequencies. So Landsat data will come across the same point on Earth every 16 days, but MODIS does it every day, but then they average that 16 days into one. So if you're gonna use something like Landsat data and that one day happens to have clouds, mm, sorry, you know, better luck next time, wait 16 days. But MODIS, maybe one day has clouds, they can average that together and then you get an average. So it's not a snapshot in time, it's an average over time. So when you're thinking about environmental conditions and the temporal scale of your data, if you're looking at maybe you know, a breeding season, maybe you want to use something like Landsat that's an exact time, right? Versus something that's an average. Kind of depends on, the, 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 I guess, the, the scope of your project. If it's something seasonal, you need to think about that temporal resolution. If it's long scale, you have this 100-year data set, maybe that's something else that you need to look at, something more averaged, right? Oh. There it is. So for example, another thing that can be wrong with temporal resolution is that if you have records that span from 1973 to 2006 and you were using some variable, and I used an example of a discrete uh, example here, you have a lot of change, right? So using data from 2006, when you have occurrence records that maybe span this whole thing, you're not actually getting a very good idea of what the species is using because the environment has changed so much over the span of your sampling of occurrence records versus the actual sampling of your environment. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I know this is probably all common sense and I just want to reiterate that, think, think when you're downloading stuff. So there's different kinds of ways to get environmental data. We have interpolated current environmental conditions such as climate NA, world clim prism. We have remotely sensed environmental products like um, MODIS and DVI, um, other vegetation indices, land surface temperature, land cover. We just have imagery if you're really bold and you want to make your own variables. You can get Landsat, Hyperion, QuickBird, all kinds of spectral resolutions, spatial resolutions. There's past climate environmental conditions. There's future climate and conditions. There's all kinds of stuff out there. And just my thing is read the metadata and understand what you're using and make sure that it fits your purpose, it fits your occurrence data, and it, it's going to work with your extent as well. And I wanted to quickly bring up what, how kind of future climate data sets work. Um, basically, we have some kind of emission scenarios. We have like the happy, optimistic, everybody rides a bike, and we have windmills, and there's no emissions. And then we have everybody drives a Humvee, and there's no more trees, right? That's kind of an exaggeration, right? But there's these different emission scenarios. How good of a humans are we? Are we good humans or bad humans? And you pick one of those kind of emission scenarios, and then you choose a global circulation model, and there's tons of global circulation models out there. And then you project that kind of climate onto the future. So if you're using climate data, again, these are things, choices that you're going to have to make and make sure that you're choosing the right kinds of things for what you're trying to study and what you're trying to show. So here's my take home message for you guys. Choose environmental variables that are relevant to your species and make sense for the extent of your study question. Okay? Two, make sure that they exhibit the same temporal resolution as your occurrence data and that they're an appropriate spatial resolution for your extent and occurrence data. However, you will never get all of these to work for you because that's just, they're just not out, there's not enough out there. You'll never find the perfect variable at the perfect resolution at the exact time frame that you need in the area that you need it. So it just never works that way. So instead, if you're gonna have to like compromise on some of your choices, make sure you can justify them and make sure that they make sense so the rest of us can understand what were you thinking? We'll know. Cool? Yeah? All right. I think that's all I got. I tried really hard to save time. <laughs> so
It's coming on. There you go. Has it a warm up. So Town mentioned it earlier this morning, but then you just mentioned metadata. Could you kind of explain what that is? Yes. I am sorry. I used a, a big word. Okay. So metadata is d data about the data. So if I were to download some environmental rasters from a data source, it should have some data associated with it. This is how we collected the data. It was collected on this day. I'm thinking of, I'll think of like Landsat. See, I, land, I, I collect a Landsat image and it'll come with something that says, hey, it was collected on this day. It was collected at this time. Here's the location it is on Earth. Here's the geographic and map projection that it is displayed in. Um, it, plus other things like how high was the satellite? What was the sun zenith? What, all those things that you might need to take that data and do something else with it. So that's what metadata is. It's data about the data. It's so interesting to read. I, <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. We have some action. Say again? Resample. Are we going to learn how to resample environmental data? There it is, yes. <laughs> I thought I saw a hand. Do we do? No? Yes. Yeah. Similar question. Okay, cool. I like it when I can answer two for one. Is there any rules like if you have a raster? So you're trying to get rasters at the same. Uh, resolution, like, do you want to uh, increase the resolution of one or decrease the resolution of the other? Increase, like, you can't decrease, because once you have a square, so this is our pixel, right? We've sampled that, and then which means it's the average of all of the things that were in there. You can't pull that information back out. Like, that's what you have. You can then take this, the pixel next to it, the four adjoining pixels, and you could average all of those to get a bigger result or a, you know, a more coarse resolution. But once you have this number, you don't know what's, con what's, what's given that number. Where did all of those individual measurements that give you the mean, you can't pull those back out. So you always have to sample up. You can't, you can't downsample. Much to the chagrin of all of us, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. If you, if you read that and you don't scream, I haven't taught you well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, for building a future climate model, or a future species distribution model. There are all of these wonderful environmental layers, like mm -hmm. the bioclimatic variables that are projected mm -hmm. for 2050 or 2070, for example. But imagine you're building a distribution for a species, and some of the most important variables might be land cover or soil type or things for which we don't have future projections. If you figure that out, let me know. Okay. <laughs> you are lucky enough to work in US, there are future projections for land cover. But the future projections for land cover, at least the ones that I'm of, of aware of uh, at USGS, are based on the um, assessment, the fourth assessment report that has the scenarios, the emission scenarios, A1, A1B, blah, blah. So we are now at the fifth uh, assessment report, and I don't know if we have uh, land cover, land use projections for for that, th um, that assessment. Report. And I would add on to that, that if you're getting cli future climate data from multiple sources, you need to make sure that your emission scenarios and your global climate scenarios or circulation models are the same, because we've run into that problem trying to get you know, variables using the same exact model. You, and it, it sometimes they go, oh, we said I had to use this emission scenario. It's like, but I needed that in this other one. So yeah, that also is something, yeah. Metadata, read it. More questions. <laughs> I feel like I'm in comps or something. Does it take a, it takes a second? Okay. <laughs> um, I've seen so many papers where they sample down, mm -hmm. and I know you're not supposed to, mm -hmm. but oftentimes, I mean, is it really bad? Oftentimes, like you can't. Is it really bad? <laughs> well, oftentimes what? there aren't like yes. high. Yes, there isn't bad. like high resolution variables then available for that location. So not, you just have to give up on the modeling? Then yes, yes. Or just okay, drop so it? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you my sob story. You ready for it? Sure. So I want land surface temperature, and I wanna check land surface temperature at multiple uh, pixel sizes, but I can't find anything below like 250 meters. But I want, I, want, I want fine resolution. So what have I done? I have downloaded 66, or ends up being like 5,000 Landsat images, and I'm calculating my own land surface temperature because the product I want doesn't exist. And I can't downsample. That's, that's crazy. So yeah, you have to kind of 
suddenly learn to be a remote science scientist? So I think yeah. like, well, so I do stuff, I do a lot of stuff like um, I model corals and it's yeah. really hard to get yes. high resolution data for the ocean. So I feel like, I know it's bad, but like I see in my field a lot modeling like yeah. down. So yeah, I get you though. I think I'll try not to. I think the closest thing I've seen to like down sampling is like um, where they've like try to average the spectral um, or 10% of this spectral is this particular wavelength, so it's probably this. But it's again, it's not. It's not good. You can't make any things. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Just wanted to chime in on that. Two points. One is most of the time that super fine resolution is all just to feel good and rigorous. And when you look at the map, it's meaningless. You know, it's the difference between a two megapixel photograph and a 10 megapixel photograph. Unless you want to blow it up and put it on you know, the side of a building, it doesn't make much difference. Mm -hmm. The other thing to remember is that the climate models, the very best of them are, have a native resolution of 50 kilometers. Most of them are in the realm of 100 to 300 kilometers. So they've already been downscaled brutally. They've been downscaled by something better than just resampling because they're bringing in covariance. But I think the real lesson is just get used to coarse resolutions. And I know you, with, if, you do, if you deal with corals, you may have very fine resolution substrates. Like maybe it's just this rock outcrop or something. But what you need to do is deal with the climate on these coarse scales, and then separate from the niche modeling process, take it down to a finer scale by saying, well, within these five pixels that are suitable, I have substrates just in these tiny, tiny subpixels. But we really should not be, even for present climates, we should not be working at a kilometer resolution. It's all interpolation. Almost all, if you look at WorldClim and those data sets, it's 99.99% interpolated. There's no data. So basically, when you use that one kilometer product, what you're using is a digital elevation model. Okay? So we should basically adapt what we do to work at relatively coarse resolutions. Yeah. Yes. You can do that too. That's option B. When you're creating your suite of environmental variables, um, I have in the past run correlation matrix to reduce the dimensionality of my data sets. Is that something that you would recommend that the other people in this room do? Yes, I would say yes. You can pull out correlated variables. Um, there are other ways of doing that too. So I also advocate using ecologically relevant variables. Sit down and actually think about what actually is going to impact my species. Um, I know that sometimes we don't know all the answers to that, so using correlation sometimes might be helpful. Um, at the scale that I like to model at, I'd like to have some abiotic variables, some biotic variables, and maybe like some terrain style variables, so I can get a little bit of everything that I think is relevant to what I'm doing. Um, that's how I like to operate. But yes, I wouldn't throw in like, look at this, I got everything in the kitchen sink. Oh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs>